This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, so here we can see a little toy frog. And now I'm gonna slowly move back. This autofocus is stupidly slow to adjust, so I can't move too quickly. And it's gone. Well, sort of. So what we just saw was an illusion that I bought for like 10 bucks on Amazon, which has to do with a type of curve that pretty much anyone watching this video has seen before. Now, how it actually works isn't that complicated, but we're gonna work our way up to it. Instead, to begin, we're gonna play a little scavenger hunt. So I'm going to hide some treasure on this map and not tell you where, but I will allow you to guess. And wherever you guess, I will tell you how far away the treasure is from that spot. The question is, how many guesses would you need to make before you knew exactly where the treasure is? Well, the answer is three, but the real question is how? Now, since this is a video, I'll have to do the guessing for you, and I'll make this your first pick, to which I say you are 100 kilometers off. So what do we do now? Well, let's just say that this line is 100 kilometers long for measurement purposes. That means the treasure could be here, since that's 100 kilometers away from your guess, or it could be here, since that's also 100 kilometers away, or it could be here, or here. In fact, the treasure could only be on this circle of radius 100, because this is every single point on the map that's 100 kilometers away from our initial guess. Now you can make a second guess anywhere you like, let's say here. And yes, it doesn't have to be on the circle. Now, for this, I would say you're 50 kilometers away. Then we can again sweep out a circle, and now we know that the treasure is at one of these two locations because those are the only points on the map at the correct distances from both of our guesses. All it takes is one more guess now. And by the way, yes, you could just guess one of the two points, but again, it mostly doesn't matter. Like we could guess here, and I'd say you're now this far away. We then make a circle that tells us the treasure is located at this common intersection point. Now, if we replace those guesses with satellites, we have the basics of how GPS works and why it's possible to figure out where someone is on Earth with such precision. With GPS, we need three satellites in space to mostly determine our location. However, since we live in a three-dimensional world, not a 2D map, we do need a four satellite to determine altitude. Based on how long it takes a signal to travel between the satellite and receiver, along with knowing how fast the speed of light is, onboard computers can calculate how far away the receiver is. With that, they can then determine a sphere where that object could be located, and where all the spheres intersect is the location of the receiver. Now, there's much more that goes into this, because as you can imagine, these systems need to be extremely accurate. With signals traveling at the speed of light, a few nanoseconds makes a difference. So there's atomic clocks being used, air calculations being made, and even relativistic effects being taken into account, since time ticks slower for objects moving at high speeds. But for this video, I'm only trying to go into so much detail. And this same analysis can even be used to detect the epicenter of an earthquake, which we can see here on Brilliant site. Now, since the math works in the same way, we know that the minimum number of seismographs needed for this would be three. But we can also see in the explanation that the seismographs, or our guesses from before, actually cannot just be anywhere since it is possible that a third circle will still lead to two intersections. So we gotta be a little careful with location, but as you can see, this is still a really powerful technique that's being utilized every day. Okay, now let's take it up a notch. We're gonna go back to the map and do the same scavenger hunt, but this time we're gonna make our three guesses all at once. To simplify the visuals a little, I'm going to make these our guesses, which I'll label points one, two, and three. Now this time I'm only going to tell you the difference in distances. As in, I'm not gonna tell you how far the treasure is from this point, which we'll call D1. That's unknown. I will not tell you the distance from the second point or D2, but I will tell you the difference in those distances is 60 kilometers. So if maybe this point is 100 kilometers from point two and 40 kilometers from point one, that's a potential spot for the treasure since the difference in distances is 60. And that automatically means this is a potential spot as well, just due to symmetry. But how do we find all potential spots? Well, what I just did was randomly select two numbers, 140, that subtract to 60. I then found all points 100 kilometers from point one and also all points 40 kilometers from point two. Those intersections would then be our points of interest. And now we can again pick just about any two numbers that subtract to 60. Like how about 90 and 30 this time? We then make a circle with a radius of 90 and another with a radius of 30. Those intersections will again satisfy a difference of 60 kilometers between points one and two. We could then just increase the radius of each circle by maybe five and get another set of potential points since the difference in distances is still 60. In fact, we can just keep slowly increasing each circle's radius at the same rate to keep that distance at 60. 
If we trace out the intersection points, we get a curve that contains all possible places the treasure could be located. The name of this curve is a hyperbola, and each one of our guesses is a focus. Now I know most of you are saying, wait, that's only half a hyperbola. But if we had just taken the circles we made and switched them, we would get the other half. Because for an actual hyperbola, we care about the positive difference or absolute value being a constant. So for those who only know a hyperbola by its equation, instead think about it for what it really is. It's every single point where the distance to a certain location off the curve minus the distance to another spot off the curve is always the same, regardless of what point you select. Then going back to our problem, we could do the same analysis for the other two points. Like I'd say D3 minus D2 is some value, we'd make another half hyperbola, and the treasure would lie at the intersection point. This is exactly how hyperbolic navigation works, where three transmitters send out pulses at the same time and a receiver measures the differences in those times. It can then use those differences to determine the hyperbolas we saw earlier, which will thus tell us the receiver's exact location. The most famous use of this is the Loran system, which stands for Long Range Navigation. It was developed during World War II and was in use for many years, but it's now outdated as it was replaced by satellite navigation and techniques we discussed earlier. Now moving on, the next curve is an ellipse, which has almost the exact same definition as a hyperbola. The only difference is if you pick a point on the ellipse and determine the distance to each focus, the sum of those values is always the same, regardless of which point on the ellipse you pick. The most interesting property of an ellipse, in my opinion, is the fact that any beam of light that passes over a focus will reflect off the curve and go through the other focus, like if the inside of this were a mirror or something. It doesn't matter where the beam comes from or its direction, this will happen, in theory, every time, and this even applies to sound or solid objects as you may have seen in NumberFile's elliptical pool table video. Most of you have probably heard of or been to one of those rooms where if you stand at the right spot, you can hear someone whispering from very far away, which was even shown in an episode of How I Met Your Mother. One example of this is Grand Central Station in New York. If this person here whispers into the wall, someone in the opposite corner, which is barely cut off in this picture, would be able to hear it with no issues, and this is due to the curvature of the ceiling above them. This phenomenon occurs often due to elliptical enclosures, where if you stand at one focus, your sound, which radiates in many directions, will ideally reflect back to the other focus. And the reflected sound will reach the other focus at about the same time, because as we saw the total distance a sound wave has to travel, or D1 plus D2, is always the same, regardless of which path it takes. One of the most impressive architectural designs where this phenomenon occurs is a Mormon tabernacle located in Utah, where apparently tour guides will drop a pin on the stand where the preacher speaks at, and the resulting sound can be heard throughout the entire building. In fact, if this stuff interests you, there's an entire career you could get into known as acoustical engineering. One thing these engineers do is design concert halls that provide an optimal acoustic experience for the audience. Things like metal panels along the ceiling of this concert hall, or the transparent baffles in this auditorium, are all put into place for acoustic purposes. The Walt Disney concert hall you see here is actually one of the most sophisticated concert halls in the world due to its architecture and layout. These engineers work on much more, such as ultrasound, sonar technology for submarines, audio processing, and more, but I just thought this was a pretty interesting field. Then probably the most famous application of an ellipse is seen within orbiting systems. In fact, all bounded orbiting bodies like the Earth, Mars, or even Halley's Comet follow elliptical paths, and what they're orbiting around, or the Sun in this case, is located at the focus of each individual curve. Something more interesting though is that all conic sections, yes, every single one, shows up in orbiting systems. Circular orbits are often taught at first to students since the math, like you see here, is easier to grasp. However, these are extremely ideal and not seen in reality. Elliptical paths are, again, what we observe for bound orbits. However, if a celestial body like a comet gets really close to Earth, it will enter an unbound orbit. As in, Earth's gravity will affect it, but due to its high speed, the comet will escape back into interstellar space. The path that it typically travels, which you can see here, is a hyperbola. But if the speed of the comet just matches the escape speed of Earth, meaning it's barely fast enough to escape Earth's pull, the shape of the path will be a parabola, which brings us to our last curve. Now, I'm sure parabolas are nothing new to most of you guys, but you may not know that these have an extremely useful property. Just like all other conic sections, parabolas have a focus, and any beam of light that goes through that focus will reflect straight out, parallel to the axis of symmetry. 
And this works backwards as well, where any beam of light coming in head on will reflect through the focus. So if you imagine those beams are wireless signals like radio waves, and we just turn this sideways, you can now kind of see why these antennas are shaped the way that they are. This thing here is located at the focus, and when signals coming in from space or whatever interact with the surface, they all ideally reflect into that one point that captures the signal. Then again, these also work in reverse. But the use of parabolas does not stop there. Solar cookers make use of this reflection, telescopes use this curvature to focus very distant light, and even the Olympic flame is traditionally lit using a parabolic reflector to concentrate sunlight. Now again, if we take one parabolic reflector and scatter light from the focus, all beams will reflect in the same direction. But what if we now put another reflector of the same dimensions right here, basically where its own vertex and the focus of the other parabola meet? Well, since they have the same dimensions, that means the bottom parabola's focus will be up here, overlapping the vertex of the other curve. This means the light will reflect again and all intersect at this point here. All of that light started its journey down here. We can think of that as light coming off an object, like maybe a toy frog. If we cut a hole in the top, the reflected light will end up focusing right at that location. And if you don't know, intersecting light rays create an image. So now we've come full circle and can finally see why this works. With a parabolic mirror at the bottom, another with a hole cut out of it on top, and the frog placed right at the vertex of the bottom curve, which is also the focus of the other, we get the illusion we saw earlier. Now, if you're a beginner and want to learn more about these algebra fundamentals, or you're more advanced and want to explore how these are applied in orbital mechanics and complex oscillating systems, then you can continue to do so at Brilliant.org, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. Brilliant hosts a wide variety of math and science courses that will not only take you through the necessary technical information, but also give you constant practice problems along the way to ensure you understand everything fundamentally. One thing I love doing on this channel is showing unique applications of math and science that we don't learn in school and a lot of ideas have actually come from Brilliant. Physics of the Everyday was one course I really enjoyed going through, which showed things like how to determine the direction a bike is traveling just by its tracks, or how to recreate a crime scene using bloodstain pattern analysis. Learning about these very real-world situations from a more mathematical viewpoint is something that always has piqued my interest. They even have daily challenges that turn learning into a habit. These questions can range from what happens when you cut a Mobius strip in half, to how did prehistoric humans keep track of time, and much more to give you a range of topics to look forward to learning. Plus, they just came out with offline courses for iOS and soon Android, so you can download some of your favorite courses right to your phone. You can then solve math or science problems and learn something new whether you're traveling, commuting to work or school, or even if you're somewhere with terrible internet connection. So if you want to get started right now and support the channel, you can click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash majorprep to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit that bell if you're not being notified. And I'll see you all in the next video.